I'm Kenneth Feinberg, and I have the great distinct pleasure of chatting for a few minutes with Elizabeth Greenspan, anthropologist, lecturer at Harvard University, and the author of a very important new book, Battle for Ground Zero, Inside the Political Struggle to Rebuild the World Trade Center. Uh, this battle is not about Al-Qaeda, and it's not about the 9-11 terrorist attacks, at least not directly. What it is about is a social anthropological study of the various political, social, and other pressures that went into the final decisions surrounding the site at the World Trade Center. Why, when, what the problems were. Uh, Elizabeth Greenspan, welcome to Afterwards. Thank you. It's great to be here. Let me start off by asking you what motivated you mm -hmm. to publish this book, to write it and take the time to do the research. What were the underlying reasons that you decided to focus on the struggle to um, re reconstruct mm -hmm. the World Trade Center? Uh, in, in the fall of 2001, I was a graduate student in Philadelphia studying urban studies and anthropology. So I was interested in cities. And I had become, was becoming very interested in how cities reconstructed themselves after wars and violence and destruction. I was um, thinking about a project in Berlin, actually, uh, and studying what the city had done in the 90s after the wall came down. There were fascinating things they were doing there to mark the wall and to mark these different moments in history. And I was putting together uh, an independent study with a professor that fall. And then 9-11 happens. It's an incredibly powerful event. It was clear that so many things are going to be changing from that moment on, you know, US policy, domestically, foreign policy. But right, all, right away, within weeks, everyone starts asking, what do we rebuild? How do we capture the feelings that we're having right now as a country in space. What kind of architecture would we imagine here? You know, and so debates, you know, started playing out in op-ed pages and in newspapers on TV about this space and and how we could possibly put something here to mark this. And so I started reading about this in the papers, and I thought I couldn't possibly just continue forward with my graduate plan when the things I'm interested in and the questions I'm interested in are now playing out right here you know, in New York City. Now, how much of the early research that you did and the early effort that you engaged in in trying to fashion sort of the thesis of mm -hmm. Battle for Ground Zero, mm -hmm. how much of this was um, your evaluation of political pressures, mm -hmm. economic pressures, pressures, emotional human nature. It was, I mean, it was all of those things. I think, and that's what was so interesting and why this place is so important, because it concentrates, you know, one 16-acre piece of land. You have political pressures, people running for office. You have politicians involved who, who care about this place and need to make something happen there. You have people who are leasing the buildings, who have billions of dollars at stake, you know, in rebuilding commercial space. Then you have New Yorkers who live around the area. You have family members who have lost loved ones. You know, nearly 3,000 people were killed. And then you have Americans and people from around the world who saw what happened, and they also feel connected. And so you have so many different interests all coming together who all want, you know, to me it, it really felt like a question of ownership a lot of the time. The key question was, who owns this piece of land? And there were lots of ways you could answer that question. There was the legal answer, which is, well, the developer who owns the lease and the Port Authority, they own the land. But for a lot of people, that was a completely inadequate answer because they thought, well, Americans own this piece of land. This is a place of American patriotism now, or this is a place where this horrible tragedy happened. We have to commemorate it. And what, when you, in your title, you talk about the battle mm -hmm. for Ground Zero. What were the major conflicting forces that were adversarial to each mm -hmm. other that gave rise to your metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, the battle for yeah. Ground Zero? Well, there are two main, the, the main tension is this one between the, pr the, the public sphere, where you have, but many groups of people within that public sphere, from architects to 
uh, New Yorkers to victims' family members to tourists, you know, all coming together, kind of the masses on the street who want to say, who are turning out at public hearings to voice their concerns. And then you have the private side. You have the developer who owns the land. You have the port authority, I mean, the developer who owns the lease. And then you have the port authority that is a kind of quasi-public private institution in New York that owns the land. And they're very invested in, they believe in building a memorial, but they also want to make sure that all of the office space that was destroyed was rebuilt, which is 10 million square feet of office space, which is quite a bit. And so almost every conflict at some level is a clash between these public and private forces, trying to figure out what the balance is, you know, because everyone believes there should be some sort of mixture between a public and private voice. How much of a role in the battle mm -hmm. did the families themselves mm -hmm who saw the land and the World Trade Center area as almost sacred mm -hmm. land, how much, aside from the developers, mm -hmm. the insurance companies, the politicians, right. the, the number crunches, right. how much of the battle involved this psychological aversion to doing anything with mm -hmm. the property other than declaring it some sort right. of, of holy land? Right. Yeah, families, many families thought of it as a burial ground because that people were killed there. And, and something that's important to think of is that they weren't just killed there, but there were, you know, just over a thousand people um, who were never found. So it was the way in which they were killed as well. It's a, it's a pretty shocking kind of violence where people were just literally decimated. And so, incinerated. Incinerated, you know, and so for those families, they didn't, weren't able to have a body or any kind of fragments of bone to bury. This place is where they think of their loved one as laying. And so it was a burial ground and many thought, especially early on in the first years after 9-11, that nothing should happen to it, just as you said. Um, many, many New Yorkers and many Americans didn't necessarily share that point of view because a lot of people wanted something, for instance, to kind of rise on the skyline again, to fill in the hole in the sky that the Twin Towers had used to fill. And so there was a sense that we should um, treat this land carefully and we should and we should commemorate, but we shouldn't, I think, there wasn't a consensus that there should be just a park, for instance, or just open space. But a lot of families worked very hard to make sure that some portion of land was put aside for a very substantial memorial. And, and it was hard. I mean, you know, the, in this kind of give and take and this kind of, I mean, a democratic process, um, people have to make compromises. And that was a big one for many families that they knew that something would be built there and that it would be developed when they wanted nothing. Now in most battles that we study in history, there are winners and losers, mm -hmm. there are heroes and villains. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book, uh, who, who do you focus on at the end of the day mm. that turn out to be the heroes in resolving this battle mm. and who do you uh, in one way or another, focus on as as um, uh, not enemies, but a, a, as those who um, were obstacles mm -hmm. to a successful getting to yes right. on the resolution of the battle. It's a hard question. This process was so long and so dysfunctional that there is almost no hero because everyone, once they entered in, was kind of tarnished at some point. I think some people believe um, that Mayor Bloomberg is something of a hero, although there are many people <laughs> who disagree with that. But he he came in later in the process. For a while, um, you know, Governor Pataki was really running things, but then he left at, in 2006, and that opened up some room for the mayor to get involved. He became the chairman of the 9-11 Foundation, and um, he also helped to bring the Port Authority and Larry Silverstein, the developer, together to start making some compromises. So a lot of, I talked to a lot of people who thought that without Bloomberg, this would still, the battles would still be going on, that he made some key, um, helped some other people make some key compromises and key decisions. But, but there are, I've talked to just as many people who continue to be furious with the kinds of 
um, agenda that they saw, you know, the city and the mayor's office having. So he's certainly one person, um, Chris Ward, who took over the Port Authority.